Good evening, folks. There we go. That's lovely to hear. And I suppose I just want to welcome you here to Lone Ends uh, and this, for this choral service. And it's really important and it's really lovely that we can be here together. And I suppose many times we maybe in the past haven't appreciated such times where we could come together like this. But hopefully we'll not take this for granted. You know, it always reminds me, particularly after COVID, we were reminded that for many people right across the world, coming to worship was something would get you arrested. And here we are in the West where we take it for granted just how easy we can come together. And I suppose as we come, let's remember that. I suppose I must say to you, it's lovely coming uh, to my first Christmas carol service in Lone Ends. So I suppose I want to thank you already. It's been a few months, but we already feel uh, at home. So at home that we'll even come fashionably late. <laughs> and I suppose as we begin our evening, I think it's been a lovely thing that we've been doing recently. But I want you to turn around and to welcome one another because... As I've said in the morning service over and over again, we don't want to just talk about family in this church. We want to be the family of God. So take some time, turn around, get out of your seats, particularly maybe there's some people who are new or people who maybe haven't been with us for a while and you don't want to introduce one another. always think that's a lovely sight, isn't it? Lovely sight to be welcomed, not just from me, but hopefully you feel welcomed because out of a place of worship, we praise. And in some ways, it's a challenge sometimes I find a choral service because we know the chorals so well, we probably could recite them off by heart. We know the verses. We know all that's going on. And I think with that in mind, it's so easy for us to do this by rote. But when we come to worship, we never want to just go through the motions. And I suppose that's my challenge here for all of us. To get our hearts right. Because we're not here to perform. We're not here because we like the carls as much as we do. But we're here because God has called us. And so we're just going to take just a few moments of silence. I think it's important for us to still our hearts to still our minds. There's lots of thoughts, there's lots of busyness, there's lots of hustle and bustle, which stops us from seeing Jesus. So let's just take some time and then I'll end that moment of silence with prayer. Lord, we are so busy running after so much at Christmas. Often so busy that we refuse to listen. And God, we just pray at this time you would open our ears so that we can hear you afresh. Open our eyes so we can see you. Open our hearts so that we can receive the love that's found in Jesus. God, we thank you that you dwell in this place and seek to speak to us in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to use the words of that famous carol just as our call to worship. And again, God calls us to worship. He's here and he is the one who gives us the desire for him. Come, O come, Emmanuel, you who are flesh, vulnerable and lowly and small. Come, O oh, come, Emmanuel, you who are great, holy, powerful, and forever. 
Come, O come, Emmanuel, the fullness of God with us. Make your home in our heart. Replace our stone with your throne. O come, O come, Emmanuel, save us, ransom us, heal us and raise us. O come, O come, Emmanuel. And that's our great cry tonight. Emmanuel means God is with us. And with that in mind, we're going to approach the Holy God now as we come with a spirit of adoration, confession, assurance. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we can be here tonight. God, as we think of many Christians right across the globe who such a reality is beyond their comprehension, they meet together in small numbers, knowing that, Lord, even just a sight can put them in prison or worse. And so, God, we pray that we would not come complacent, that we won't just go through the motions, because we know just tr how truly special this time of year is. God, we're so thankful at this time of year that we can see friends and family who we love, that we can spend time having fun and joy with them. God, we thank you at this time of year that we can indulge in festive feasting, enjoying all kinds of delicious foods. Lord, we thank you at this time of year that we can enjoy those annual traditions that we can enjoy together with friends and family. And God, as we think of each and every one of them, we, we come with thankful hearts. Hearts that acknowledge that each and every one of these good things come from you. And so, Lord God, as we enjoy these good gifts from you, we pray that you would not allow our hearts to gravitate to the things you have created. Instead, that we will look to the creator. As we think of those relationships that we are blessed with, it may point us to the fact that we have been made to find joy in relationship with you and our brothers and sisters in the Lord. As we enjoy the feasting, may it lead us to be, be reminded that, that you have prepared a feast for your people for all eternity. As we think of traditions which bring us such joy at Christmas time, may it remind us of the daily walk of following Jesus. And so as we come to one such example of a Christmas tradition, as we come to this, our lessons and carol service, God, we pray that you would not allow us to fall into familiarity. Because, Lord, that often breeds contempt. May we not allow these familiar songs and familiar verses to leave our hearts untouched and our minds engaged. Instead, we pray that you would allow us to encounter you, the living God, because, God, we know that you speak and you are present within this gathering. God, we thank you even now as we think of the Christ of Christmas, that you are no longer a baby. You are no longer on a cross or on a tomb. But even now as we come and worship, that you are the right hand of the Father, interceding for your church here in Lone Ends. Yet, Lord, as we think of your splendor and your glory, our sin is exposed. And so we ask as we come to worship you that you may search our hearts and reveal the ways that we have fallen short of the glory of God. We confess that we have failed you this Christmas. While with our lips and our words that we have maintained that Christ is the reason for the season, yet God, in the way that we have lived, we have spoken a different message. We have pushed you to the periphery of our Christmases, just adding a, a simple story and thinking that's enough. There are times where we have not sought to live at peace with all men, instead harboring grudges, even though you are the Prince of Peace. Lord, we have fallen all too many times at looking in joy in all the wrong places, rather than coming to you, the true joy giver. And so, God, as we come to you, we look to the Lamb of God given to us 
for only you can take away the sin of the world. And so we come in faith, asking that you would cleanse and renew us so that we may walk according to your ways, O Lord. And we cry from our hearts, O come, O come, Emmanuel, dwell with us once more and prepare us for Christmas part two, where you will come again, not as a baby in a manger, but as a king to reign all creation. And so we finish our prayer with the words that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we're going to have our first lesson. And it's going to be taken from Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 13, and followed by Genesis 22, verses 15 to 18. And it's going to be read by a member of Kirk Session, uh, Trevor Boyd. Uh, and in this, we're going to hear about the curse and the Christmas promise. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 13. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And the man said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then the Lord God asked, Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, The woman you gave to be with me. She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. So the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. Then Genesis chapter 22 verses 15 to 18. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, this is the Lord's declaration. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the city gates of their enemies, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring, because you have obeyed my command. Yep. Thank you, Trevor. And we see that the curse would be reversed through a seed through whom the whole world would be blessed. And we're going to come and we're going to raise with one voice and we're going to sing in unison our first carol, which is, O come, all ye faithful.
we're now going to have our next lesson, which is taken by Alan Johnson, and it's going to be from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2, 6, and 7. And in this, we see the hope of Christmas is identified. Isaiah 9, uh, 2, uh, 6 to 7. The people walking in the darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Amen. Thank you, Alan. And we're now going to sing our next item of praise. We're going to sing... Once in Royal David City.
In our next lesson, we'll be taken from Isaiah chapter 11. And in it, we'll see the branch in which the Christmas hope would finally arrive. And it's going to be led by Luke representing salt and Noah representing light. And following our reading, we're going to be transported to Bethlehem as we'll sing, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. Then the shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and the branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest in him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute justice by what he hears with his ears. But he will judge the poor righteously and execute justice for the oppressed of the land. He will strike the land with a scepter from his mouth, and he will kill the wicked with a command from his lips. Righteousness will be a belt around his hips. Faithfulness will be a belt around his waist. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fattened calf will be together, and the child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze, the young ones will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like cattle. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit, and a toddler will put his hand into the snake's den. They will not harm or destroy each other on my entire holy mountain, for the land will be as full of knowledge of the Lord's as the sea is filled with water. Thank you very much, boys. Now we're going to stand to sing again as we visualise and we're part of that song, O Little Town of Bethlehem.
Our next lesson will prepare the way for Jesus' arrival on the earth. As Dory Porter will read on behalf of the Presbyterian woman. And it's going to be read from Luke chapter 1. And following that, we're going to join together to sing our next piece, The First Noel. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. Gabriel predicts Jesus' birth. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favoured woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to your son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be, since I have not had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. See, I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it happen to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Thanks be to God. Now we come and we sing our next piece, the first Noel.
Isabel from the music team will now come and we're going to, we're now finally get to that wondrous point where the Christ, the one who was prophesied all the way back in Genesis, is finally born in fulfillment of that long Christmas promise. Luke chapter 2 verses 1 to 12. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a saviour was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Amen. Yes, well, I'll give you a minute or two to get back. <laughs> We're now going to... Continue in the praise of God, the God who from start to finish keeps his promises. And so we're going to reflect and we're going to join together once more as we sing Silent Night.
Our final scripture reading will be taken from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. And we're going to base a short uh, talk on this as well. But here in some ways we've seen what's happened on the earth. In some ways here we have the cosmic picture of the impact which Jesus would make. So this is John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not that light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light which gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not recognize him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be become children of God, children not born of natural descent, nor of human derision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. May the Lord bless our reading to us. Let's pray. God, we do pray as, as we have had this word and had the, the many scripture readings, that Lord God, you would feed our souls. For we're told that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. And so prepare our ears to hear you, prepare our eyes to see you, and prepare our hearts to respond to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to think of many of the stories that you grew up with. It's remarkable about how many of those revolve around a dysfunctional family unit. Think about some of the ones you may watch. There's Annie from the Annie musical. There's Anne of Green Gables in the book series. There's Margot, Edith and Agnes from the Despicable Me movies. Such situations don't only make good stories, but I think that all of us were made in a way that, in one level or another, that we can connect with them. You see, our family background, whether we know it or not, often influences how we see the world around us. And in many ways, I never realised this quite so much until recently I was reading my friend's book, My friend had written a book in tribute of his late sister, Charlene. And Charlene had a difficult life. Charlene had spent the first number of months of her life alone in her hospital bed, abandoned by her biological parents. She wasn't given much chance of surviving her cystic fibrosis, yet she proved to be a fighter and fought on against all odds. It wasn't long before a Christian doctor and his wife began to become attached to this young baby. It didn't take long before that couple to be smitten with her. Eventually, Charlene was brought home for weekends. And eventually, again, she became part of the Barr family. That young girl abandoned at birth became part of a new family. And not only was she given a new mum and dad, but Charlene was given the gift of having five new siblings. The Barr family are one of the most caring and loving Christian families that I've ever met. Yet, Charlene's life was difficult. 
She was, there, her life was filled with many battles. But she fought on to the last until she sadly passed away in 2010. Yet before she passed away, from her very hospital bed, she decided to make a difference. And so on her hospital bed, she decided to fundraise for, for children just like her to go to school. And remarkably, that young girl in a hospital bed raised enough money for a school to be built in Uganda. And her legacy still continues in the Charlene Project. The Charlene Project, which has built a number of schools and supported 